This is Start the Storefront. Scaling a business and cementing your place in an emerging market is a special kind of struggle. While you're busy building your own brand, you've also got to be busy educating consumers about the market's very existence. The appeal of all of this is, of course, if and when consumer trends shift, any company with a foothold sees massive growth and all the rewards that come with it. One need look no further than Tesla to see how proper timing and a few lucky breaks can launch a small startup into a Fortune 100 company. Our guest today is Emily Griffith, founder of Lil Bucks, and the emerging marketplace in question is centered around buckwheat. Buckwheat is a familiar dietary staple in other cultures around the world, but when it comes to America, it's still in its infancy. Buckwheat is naturally packed full of nutrients and antioxidants, while at the same time being gluten-free, since it's a fruit seed and not a grain. So, in following recent superfood trends, it checks a lot of the same boxes. The ability to educate and appeal to a mass audience will be the difference between ending up like Tesla or Fisker. So listen in as we cover everything from why consumers don't want to sacrifice taste for health, why she focused on building her brand before building her business, and how she owes her success to getting on the shelves of Whole Foods to a cleaning lady. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Emily from Little Bucks. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. For people who don't know, what does your company do? So we make crunchy snacks and superfood toppings from sprouted buckwheat seeds. And it's all, you know, like a crunch you've never had before, but gluten-free, grain-free, you know, protein, fiber, all the good stuff. And it's delicious. What made you want to start this company? What was the thing you were like, you know what, I'd really love if this existed? I mean, it was honestly just an obsession that, a personal obsession that started when I was living in Australia. Where in Australia were you? I was in Sydney, which was so good. So already, you know, being from the Midwest, living in a place like Sydney. Very is, different. Yeah, like such a dream. And I was so inspired by everything there, the beach culture, the healthy food culture, surfing, everything, living my best life. And while I was there, I had a life-changing acai bowl, <laughs> as any millennial does. What year was this? This was 2016. So I was there 2016, 2017. And the reason that this acai bowl was so life-changing was because the cafe put sprouted buckwheat seeds on the bowl instead of a granola. And I love healthy food and stuff like smoothie bowls, especially things that can like taste like an unhealthy version of healthy food. So like a smoothie bowl is kind of like ice cream to me if you do it right. But especially when you're getting at cafes, they're always putting like a sugary granola on it and that never really resonated with me. So I'm like, they're like, well, do you want the buckwheat or do you want the granola? I'm like, I don't know. Sure, the buckwheat. Sure. And I mean, I'll never forget it. Like, I'm a big texture person, I think, really texture forward food. So having that crunch on the cold smoothie bowl was like, oh, what is this? And then on top of that, how amazing I felt after eating it, which I guess is due to like buckwheat's extremely low glycemic. It's grain free. It was low sugar because it was not even flavored. So, and it's packed with protein. So genuinely was so full and energized to the point where I, you know, I talked to the cafe about the buckwheat, yeah. found like the bulk yeah. version of it at the Australia has a bunch of like bulk food stores. Mm -hmm. So I was buying like at least a pound every week and topping like yogurt, smoothie bowls, of course. Just on your like, own. Yeah. Okay. This was just like a personal okay. use thing. Yeah. And then I mean, it was just kind of one of those things I get really excited about and get a little obsessed and go down a rabbit hole. And I'm just like putting it on everything and making like, instead of making my energy balls with oats, I'm using the buckwheat seeds. And it's just like, how is this not a thing that I've heard of before? And I figured because uh -huh. I'm from the Midwest, like. You just hadn't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah like yeah. surely it must this exist is in, in LA. Los Angeles, like, right? Yeah, yeah, surely. Yeah. Is it sourced in Australia? Is the reason why it's so popular there is because they have it in abundance? No? No, I think it's just they're, you know, a little, sometimes a little bit a step ahead. Like even the keto uh, craze was already massive there when I was living there. And then about a year back into living in the States, it became as massive as it was in Australia. So I think sometimes they're just like maybe a half step ahead of it's definitely a healthier culture for sure. It's also warmer. And so people generally yeah. eat the right thing. And it's a smaller population. So much smaller. I mean, I'm not going to quote numbers here, but I mean, the population of Australia is probably like the size of Minnesota. 
don't quote me on that, but you know, <laughs> you like, heard it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you heard it here first. Ex- <laughs> geographic expert Emily Griffith, but <laughs> an idea there can spread a lot more quickly than it does in the states. Some what happens, and you you come back and you're like, I gotta buy, I gotta buy this in bulk. I need it back in my life. What is your first step from like loving something to wanting to make it a business? Well, when I was moving back, I actually didn't really want to move back, but I moved yeah. back for love, and that's the guy I'm marrying oh. in a few months. So. Fortunately, it was a good, yeah, it was a good risk there. Now, were you in love with him prior to your trip? Too? Well, yeah, of course we met okay. uh, five months before. I, we met the day after I signed a contract to take a job in Sydney. Cause, what was you know, the job? Uh, I was working at an ad agency. All my clients, ironically, were like big food. So I worked on Hormel Foods in the States, like Spam, canned meat. And then I went That's over to Australia, departure. ended up with like basically the Tyson Foods of Australia. I'm like, why do I keep getting these like big meat clients? Right. But yeah, so I was moving back to be with him. He was still working in Chicago, where I'm from. So I was moving back and a bit bummed about it. So I was like, I want to bring something. Like, I'm so inspired here in Australia. And then I'm like, where also, where am I going to get the buckwheat that I'm eating every day? And that's where I was kind of doing some research and going on like us.google.com. So while I was still in Australia and realizing nothing is coming up for this, except for like the like Australian brands. It was just a really innocent, like, I'm a graphic designer. Like, how hard, you know, someone else had an idea to get their food product on the shelf. Like, I'll just, like, whip up some packaging and everyone's going to be obsessed with this. And, you know, done deal. Mm -hmm. Were there any other products that stuck out to you, too, while you were in Australia that you were like, this should definitely be in America? Actually, another one. (laughs) I still, like, found I had these preserved, like, oh, an idea for a later date. But now it's already a thing in America. Um, Another one was coconut bacon. Have you heard of that? No. Um, I actually met a brand at Expo West a few weeks ago, actually based out of San Diego, who does it. Like legit coconut meat, and they like do something with it, like maybe maybe smoke it? So actually they literally, I don't know, it's something with the actual like harder coconut chips, and they do flavoring with it. And it does, I don't even know what they put on it, but it tastes like you put on your salads, and it tastes like bacon on a salad. And that was a thing in Australia. With the, the departure like of Australia, you go back to Chicago and you realize that you can't get this buckwheat anywhere. So like your first step is, oh, I've got to manifest this into existence. But where do you then go from there? Like where do you source the buckwheat from? Like is the Midwest, the buckwheat capital of the world that we don't know about? Um, actually, yeah. <laughs> right? uh, actually, in the States, um, the most buckwheat is from New York. There's okay. New York. Wow. part of New York State that it's the Finger Lakes region. It's a really great place to grow buckwheat. But buckwheat actually grows really well in cold climates and poor soil. So we're actually now sourcing most of our buckwheat from a regenerative organic farm in Minnesota. So New York's definitely a place to get your buckwheat, but we happen to be producing, and I'm from the Midwest, and actually found a really solid, like cost-wise, a really good supply chain out of Nebraska, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's where it's from. And it's actually really interesting with what's going on in uh, Russia, Ukraine. Obviously, there's a lot of pressure on our food system from like a grain uh, perspective, but also buckwheat. Russia is the number one producer of buckwheat, and Ukraine is number three. So wow. the fact that we're it's sort so of- cold. Yeah. yeah, and it's also like a national dish for both Russians and Ukrainians. What's What do they do with it? Um, it's called kasha. So they cook the buckwheat seeds, and it's almost like a porridge. So unflavored, it could be like a side dish. And then they'll do like put some flavors in it, have it for breakfast, almost like o- their version of oats. Mm-hmm. You've had it? I haven't, but oh. I've heard of it. Okay. Yeah. Kasha. Yeah, when I, would, when I launched it, especially in Chicago, there's a big Ukrainian population there, and I'd have people like, there's running one up to big my Ukrainian. Table. <laughs> oh yeah, they'd be like, "I grew up with this, but like never have seen buckwheat in this way." And I'm like, "Yeah, the Aussies came up with a totally different use for it." That's so fascinating. Yeah, I'm like in this buckwheat subculture. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you're like meeting all these people that you probably didn't know existed. And so, oh yeah, what was your first step there? So you come back, you find you find a source, mm-hmm. and now packaging education wise, you're talking to your friends and family, and they're probably like. Is this a thing? What is oh my this? Gosh. What do you they do with this? They thought it was out of my mind, for sure. And then you're putting it on yogurt or an acai bowl right. or a smoothie. Mm-hmm. And so are they just thinking like, oh, is she going to start a smoothie company? Yeah, it was really funny coming back. I feel like, I mean, fortunately, I'm from 
you know, a really supportive family, even when I think they were probably a little skeptical, like our daughter's lost her mind. She's been down under, like coming up with like spewing all this weird stuff about buckwheat. And especially being in the Midwest where trends, especially a health food trend, don't generally start there. It's a really tough proving ground, but I was so hell bent on getting this out in the world and nobody could tell me no. So I just kept talking to as many people as possible, weaseling my way into events. I mean, there are some, obviously a lot more brands, especially in the natural products and emerging brand space are coming from the coast or Austin, Texas or Boulder. Um, but in the Midwest, we have like Simple Mills, RX Bar and a few others, Think Jerky. So I actually got myself into an event at the Chicago Soho House where I got to meet those founders and start kind of getting pointed in the right direction and then just keep meeting more people in the industry because I was 25 when I started this. So yeah. I had no connection to this world. What advice did they give you? Like what was like the main point? Like, oh, you've got to raise capital like right away. You've got to scale this thing. Like what, what do you remember from those conversations? It's funny because now knowing how capital intensive CPG can be, that was not the advice I was getting for probably in some ways a, a good thing because first and foremost, I'm coming out with something so unique. Like we were just talking about our friends Ourobora. They're kind of just disrupting, coming up with a new sparkling water, but like everyone and their grandma knows what like sparkling water is. Who knows what sprouted buckwheat is, who knows how to consume this. So there was already like an uphill battle of the messaging and the product. And so one of the things actually one founder gave me really good advice, actually a couple founders probably had to hear this a few times until it resonated, but they saw our first product line, the sprouted buckwheat crunch, which is basically the sprouted buckwheat seeds in different flavors. And that's what people are using to top their yogurt, smoothies, oatmeal, et cetera. But when I'm talking about trying to become like a large scale consumer brand that could be anywhere, they took one look at my product. They're like, you need to come up with something clustered. This needs to be snackable. Like it needs to be something they can eat. And that's what led to launching Cluster Bucks, which is our snackable granola. So they're the buckwheats bound together with other superfoods like coconut and pepitas and has fun flavors. So it's a lot like we know what clusters are. We've everyone's seen those. So I kind of had to do a lot more product development. So I'm grateful that, you know, I didn't raise too much money too early because I think there was like still a lot of product development to do in a tough proving ground. But ultimately, I think if you could make something work in the Midwest, I want to have a brand yeah. that's in every pantry across America. So did you go direct to consumer first or did you go into the try to get into the grocery store? Yeah. So I spent the first summer doing fitness festivals, farmers markets. And that was with the clusters or with the The little bucks. Just the little bucks. The little the okay. seed line. And kind of getting consumer feedback, getting it out there. And I made quite a splash in it's a smaller community in Chicago, but like the wellness scene there, fitness and wellness, people were so excited and it's you know the only place you can get this so it kind of spread organically from there so we did have some d to c sales but it, this was very small like a side hustle like 10k in our first year very much figuring it out organically no idea what i was doing and then starting to talk into like okay how do we get this into stores started with about five stores and just demoed you know going in and doing the samples because once people try the crunch there's no competition and eventually was able to prove even in that small data set like okay we're getting really high turns in these five stores so you know I kept knocking on Whole Foods door <laughs> and being like check it out we're like the only brand in the country doing this we're regenerative sustainable healthy blah 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 we have high turns at these five stores so we're ready to go, you know, we're ready for all the whole foods you can give us. And, you know, had to weasel my way in a few <laughs> different ways, but ended up getting a yes from Whole Foods Midwest. Okay. Do you have a good story that you can share with <laughs> us about how you I mean, trick them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there was, it's hard to say what was the thing that ultimately worked, but I did stop by their office a few times and... You know, one time just kind of like... Not invited, right? Not invited. <laughs> no. And I think, you know, you're just confident. And you're like, oh, I'm going up to Whole Foods. And my goal was just to drop it off. And it was at like 5.15 p.m., which 
to me at the time I was, you know, freelancing full time to bootstrap a little buck. So 5 p.m. is, you know, noon to normal people. It's the middle of the day. So I'm like, oh, stopping by and everyone from Whole Foods is gone. But I thought like maybe I'd catch someone and the cleaning, the only person there was the cleaning lady. So she let me in assuming I was an employee. So then I just went straight to the office <laughs> of the, the Midwest buyer and was like, I'm kind of you know, breaking in, but I'm going to leave this here. No, there's no B&E. You were let in. <laughs> I know. True. Yeah. So, you know, technically I was allowed in. Felt a little creepy, but. And so you left, you left some product on the desk, mm -hmm. right? With yeah. a note, with a note saying, Hey, remember me? I know where you live. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you loved this product yeah. last time I saw you. Cause I've been giving them, like we were first selling in like, you know, brown craft paper bags with a sticker on it. And we had just gotten our new packaging and I'm like, give us a chance. We're ready were we ready? But <laughs> they ultimately did say, yes, they're ready to bring us into not just a lot of brands, especially starting very like bootstrap local, start with a few Whole Foods. They're a local brand, but they're like, we're going to bring you into the Midwest region, which was 51 stores at the time. And so we're like, okay. I didn't even know, like, okay, one of the most common distributors for Whole Foods is UNFI. I'd never heard of that before. And we had just Same. secured the account. <laughs> okay. And so then I was like, okay, we need to go raise a little bit of friends and family money to make sure we execute this and okay. the whole plan. How much did you need for that? Um, we raised 260K. And the whole plan, I had trained 21 brand ambassadors across the Midwest because the Midwest is a super vast region, tons of cities. And our whole plan was we need to demo the crap out of this because it's all about getting people to try that crunch and then it's game over. But guess when we launched? COVID. Yeah. March 2020. <laughs> nice. Perfect timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That was a ride. That's a good story, though. Yeah. So in terms of pricing, like, how were you pricing it? Six ninety nine. So similar to, I had a hard time with this first product line, Lil Bucks, uh, in retail. Like, versus online, amazing, because it's such a niche. There's no competition. Once people find us, the repeat purchase on that is great. But that does not translate the same into retail. So we're like, do we go next to superfoods? Because it has the superfood benefits of like a chia or hemp seed. Or we buy granola because that's basically how it's used. But it's like a little different. So that was a hard thing. But ultimately, we decided to go buy granola. Okay. Um, working was with that a more expensive category than the other one? It's a faster moving category okay. in retail. So you're choosing velocity there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And just kind of something. So like the healthy granola. People are looking at it like, oh, this is a healthier superfood granola. Right. But that's actually really smart. Yeah. Because granola is a lot of sugars. Exactly. A, a, not healthy. Typically. And people are just looking a lot of times when they're using granola, they want that uh, texture benefit and they want just like a little more protein or whatever to fill them up with their yogurt. And they don't want all this crap. Like I was the same way. I just didn't want all the crap that came with your standard granola. So you're in 21 stores. You're at 699. What happens? So COVID hits. So you can't do any, you can't have a squad. You can't no do No squad. Taste. It was so tough. We didn't even hit the shelves at most Whole Foods until August of that year. But you have everyone in the store now. So that's another, right? So it's like people are only going to the grocery store because it's the only place they're allowed to go. Right. But the funny thing, so everyone's like, oh, well, you're in food. And I am grateful and on the flip side, our e-commerce had blown up at that point, sure, yeah. which was great. And that's my background was in digital marketing. So that was great. But of course, my North Star was, you know, you get a big chance, an opportunity with a retailer like Whole Foods. Like that is how so many brands that are widespread today, like made their impact was getting a region of Whole Foods, making sure they have the highest turns they could possibly have, and then rolling out into more regions. And that's how it starts. So I was like, this is our opportunity. We got to get this right. But A, you know, all this, the grocery store rush was mostly for like mac and cheese, not like cool emerging brands. Like we did see a bump where we were on the shelf, but not compared to. So people were wanting comfort food to get them through this right. traumatic shared like, experience. Yeah. Like the time where you feel like all this abundance and you're like ready to try something like really healthy and energizing when you're like depressed and right. <laughs> you just want ice cream. But also another challenge was we were supposed to be rolling out into stores at that time. And for example, we're rolling out into Bristol farms in LA right now. And I'm going to go visit them after this. And like, we might 
like some stores we're seeing that were on the shelves, but it might be another week. Usually we allot like three weeks to kind of gradually hit all the shelves and make sure we're there. And this was supposed to be happening during like the craziest experience the grocery stores have had. So I'm calling them, hey, are our little bucks on the shelf? They're like, what? No, like uh, not now. Yeah, so right. it's like half of the stores, we weren't even hitting the shelves until August, calling like every week, 51 stores to try to get on. So it was a trip and actually what ended up happening and it's tough to assess all the data and like learnings from this because you have to take it in a grain of salt that this was in a completely unprecedented time but we actually ended up a year later march 2021 launching cluster bucks okay the clusters into whole foods and switching them out with the little bucks and how did that perform right off the bat a lot better just because we still couldn't get in stores and do demos at the time but a we had learned how to drive velocity virtually and things had loosened up a little. How do you do that? A big one for us. So literally we were sending coupons. We were doing ads, like input your Instagram ads, input your email and address and we'll send you coupons and kind of put it in like, you know, we just packed envelopes. This was super scrappy. Yeah. But literally you're getting like a personal signed note from the founder. I mean, we printed the note and I just, sure. you know, a little autograph. But, and putting the coupons in there, and they're just in envelopes, which so is stamps, um, and sending them to homes to go try it. Uh, influencers really leaning on the community we had built leading up to the pandemic. Those were our champions. So if we can get them to buy and get them to repeat, then we have enough velocity to continue opening doors. So just had to really focus and be narrow on who we were targeting and mostly that being people that were already engaged with us or, you know, Instagram, like lookalike audience like yeah. most likely to Who engage. is your audience? Like who is your, what do they look like? What age are they? What are they into? I mean, when I started, you know, so naive, I'm like, well, anyone who likes crunch or so likes everyone feeling good, <laughs> um, anyone who eats breakfast, I don't know. But um, <laughs> no, we've definitely seen the most pickup from millennial and Gen Z women that are just generally urban, suburban, but actively kind of looking for ways to live a healthier lifestyle. I think where I overshot it at some points was being too healthy. Like we were really in, when we launched Cluster Bucks at first, we were really gung ho. Actually the first tagline of Cluster Bucks right now, if you look at the packaging, it says grain free superfood clusters. The first packaging for Cluster Bucks was adaptogenic buckwheat clusters, which in LA, you know. That's that an emerging market right now. Yeah. Right. I mean, and um, I love adaptogens as a consumer, and we still use them in the products. Yeah, you have but... maca in right. this one. Do you find it turned people off who oh, weren't yeah. in these markets? Terrifying word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like at Air One, fine. They're excited about that, but pretty much everywhere else. So to that point, like, do you have something that looks different in Air One than you do in the Midwest somewhere? No, we actually, we're trying to find the balance of what works for the Erwan customer because that's kind of where this starts. Like we are creating a better food brand that the only sugar in it's from maple syrup. Like we do like using these next level ingredients, but at the end of the day and something we learned with our target audience, no one wants to sacrifice taste. Those hardcore health people will sacrifice taste, but we want a larger market than that. I keep saying I want buckwheat and I want our buckwheat in every pantry across America. And that is these hardcore health foodies, but it's also like the mom from Dallas, Texas that just wants to like be energized and feel good. But like, she's not trying to eat like, or like take wheatgrass shots every morning. <laughs> do you want these to be in movie theaters? Like, where do you want these to be? Like, how do you see making it, not so much like a snack category, but there is something there, right? Where it's like, you're introducing a healthier option. Right. And we actually do a lot of uh, retailers are starting. It's kind of an interesting space to be in with the clusters. Even in Whole Foods, our category is actually functional snacks. And so, for example, we're launching into four divisions of Kroger in a couple months, which is exciting. And there we're like in the gluten free, like granola area. It's a little too soon for them to have like I think grocery stores are trying to figure out what do we do with like these healthy like bites, balls, clusters, even Target. We were in the Target accelerator last year, which was 
massive in kind of helping refine our cluster bucks specifically for retail. And one of the things even they're trying to figure out is having that like kind of more healthy snack set. Cause there's like, there's a big difference between Doritos and right. cluster bucks, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but they're both serving a similar eating occasion. Sure. Maybe not when you're like really baked at two in the morning, but Doritos so might have us there. <laughs> you mentioned that you were freelancing on the side when you started this, uh, this mm-hmm. company to help, you know, get some capital and, and just support yourself while you were doing it. At what point though, did you realize that you had to stop that and just go full time into low bucks? Yeah, that was definitely quite a learning curve for me. Um, I mean, I got really, really, really burnt out because I was working so When you know, hard. you know, right? Yeah, when you know, you know, you kind of reach a point where, I mean, I think everyone has felt overwhelmed before where you're like yeah. shell-shocked from like, you know, it's beyond stress. It's just like another level of, I can't handle all this anymore. And that was at the same time we were getting ready to go into Whole Foods. So this was right before the pandemic. And that's where I was like, okay, it's go time. Going to raise a little bit of friends and family money. 260K is not enough to like have a salary. But by then my boyfriend at the time now, fiance, we were like, okay, I could afford, you know, I have some saved up from freelance. And then like, we're going to take off in Whole Foods. And, you know, I'll be paying myself by like April or May, which (laughs) I like peeled off the freelance clients. It took pretty much through Q1 to do that of 2020. But then, yeah, I didn't end up paying myself for quite a while after that. But we did go live at my family's like lake cabin in Michigan. So the expenses were low at least. <laughs> yeah. And, and probably a pretty scenic place to conduct your business from as well. Yeah. Definitely better than our 500 square foot apartment in Chicago. That wouldn't have worked. How many stores are you in now? We're in about 180 stores now, and we're about to add 600, so between HEB and Texas. So we're launching into 180 HEB stores, okay. which is an awesome account, so we're really excited. What's the hard part for your business? Is it just is it the consumer? Is it basically just like you're, you, you feel like you're from the future, to go back to something I referenced earlier, where it's like you're ahead of this, and so the, the, the question you have in Target is asking you is, where do you fit? Right. Do I put you next to granola? Are you not that? Are you functional food? That sounds weird Mm -hmm. and esoteric and kind of whack because if I'm some, if I'm a consumer going for a snack, I want a snack. The problem is I don't want it to be called functional food. I want it to look like a snack that I consume. Exactly. And this falls in that category, but I'm like an anomaly in that world probably, or just call it like one of the various things that you could market me with would be functional food. And so what's like the, what's the thing that you think this all takes off if? I think that we're ready for it, but the journey of my business, I've been doing this since I got back from Australia. I've been working on it since 2017. We launched, you know, doing the cute little farmer's markets in 2018. 2019 was when we started gearing up for Whole Foods. 2020, as you know, was Whole Foods, blah, blah, blah. Here we are today. That whole journey has been figuring out. I was ahead of time in some ways. Like I've had that feeling for a long time. And finally, especially through years of learning and product refinement. We have a really good product innovation advisor who's helped on the strategy, refining the taste, making it a lot more approachable. Like we want finish the bag quality, which we feel like we finally have reached with the cluster box. Mm -hmm. Target helped us be like, okay, how like with our packaging, we just relaunched the cluster box packaging. It looks like the, it has some elements of the old stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But even if you look at There's been three iterations of it with messaging and getting it to a point where like we feel comfortable having this on a target shelf or, you know, I'm not ready to say that it's going to be on a Walmart in Oklahoma yet, but we're ready for high end conventional. We've seen it work at a Mariano's in Chicago, so we know we can get turns. But yeah, now we're going to be launching into 180 higher end HEB stores in Texas and then TBD on the number, but four divisions of Kroger in California, Colorado, and the P- Pacific Northwest. So, and, and this is the hero product, the clusters. Mm-hmm. That's it, right? Especially in retail. Yeah. And do you feel like you need to stop maybe making little bucks, or in terms of dollars, it's still like it, it's it justifies its own line? Yeah, this is actually the little bucks. Is I just love it. it's knock on wood, but it's supply <laughs> chain. It's been. I've had very different experiences with two product lines and kind of figuring out, scaling up the the operations on it. And 
Lil Bucks is very easy for us to make. We have it completely streamlined. The cogs are super low on it. There's not been any, I mean, knock on wood, but no drama. Yeah. yeah. And it's, we actually make it where we do all our sprouting for all the buckwheat. That okay. is the base of our product. Okay. So, so it's low, it's low cost. That's, that's an essential step too, by the way. From what I right. know, it's like you can't absorb it in its raw form, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like when I think about your product and I think like I go on your Instagram as an example and I'll go, okay, cool. The cluster box, you don't need anything. There's no additive. It's just like, boom, here it is. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. Finish the bag. When it comes to this, it's like very much put it on a smoothie, put it on yogurt, do something with it. Right. And so I need something. It's like a compliment. It's a compliment. Yeah. And so then the question becomes like, how do I get the compliment? I always think like, is it a partnership that you do? Mm -hmm. Is it you blow it out of the water with like Chobani or maybe you don't like Chobani and maybe you go with like Daily Harvest or somebody who's making smoothies? Oh, yeah. I'm on the prowl for a partner there. I have one for you. Oh. Live More Organics. Oh, yeah. So when I do this at home, right? So Live More, we spoke to them, not on the podcast, but just like as yeah, a they'll like be coming a, on soon. like advisory call. And so they hit me up and we're talking about their brand. And they're telling me how like Daily Harvest is a billion dollar company. Daily Harvest only goes D to C. And I'm like, so what are you guys doing? They're like, same thing, but we want to be in Costco. I'm like, you just told me you have a billion dollar business. That's a D to C and you're trying to go to Costco. I'm like, they've already figured it out for you. And they're like, yeah. oh, and by the way, Amazon has this amazing partnership where they're using our cups, but it's going to be an Amazon fresh product. And I'm like, do you not read the tea leaves? Like Amazon is doing what you should be doing and they have the data to suggest this is a no brainer. Like it's right in front of you. So anyway, they're in the process of moving to D2C through all this. So we have like a bunch of boxes at the house. Oh, wow. And every time I make a smoothie, this is what I add to it from when Nikki right. sent it over. And I'm just like, this is the thing. Exactly. Because it's a two in one. Yeah, obviously there's a discussion there financially that it seems easy to me, but it, the complimentary thing like yogurt makes it hard for people. Like I don't also don't know that, like, do you know that behavior? So if I'm in the grocery store and I buy this, am I then going to the, the yogurt aisle or, yeah. or does that not exist? I, even actually what we're doing a test right now is chippers, which are kind of like those branded displays that are temporary in stores in a couple of our a couple of retailers were putting them next to yogurt to kind of have that like association. Yeah. Oh, these go together. But I mean, to your point, Lil Bucks has been an amazing D to C product. Cause again, we can have that content of you see, you know, you're looking at the product listing and you see it on this beautiful smoothie bowl or in a yogurt. Right. And it's, it resonates that way. Like, Oh, I need this. I'll do my yeah. online grocery shopping and like add it all together. But again, when you're, in the grocery store, if this is in the granola aisle, right. you have to have a really educated or interested consumer who's yes. making that leap. And you can't assume most Americans are not right. making that leap. So totally. I just think when I run out of live more, this stops being used in my house. And so that's, oh, you see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And so that's the problem. We got to keep, it's like, we need elevated consumption of like, or I just have and wine smoothies. and I want a dessert and I just open the bag and go, oh, yeah. all right, that was good. That's my dessert today. <laughs> yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. But it's like hard. It's hard. Where this seems more straightforward. Exactly. Yeah. Is the plan to make more different, more flavors? Yeah. Always yeah. a thing you're working on? Okay. So we actually just launched the snickerdoodle and coconut maple a month ago. So another thing that we kind of strategized with our Cluster Bucks product line, when I launched it, there was only two flavors. We launched them straight into Air One, of course, like the first to pick up anything cool like that. But our two flavors at the time, it was called Chocolate Reishi and Turmeric Lemon, which you're eating right now, which are both awesome flavors, but so different. So scary. Yeah. I mean, in Air One, those terms probably work. But right. like I think we discussed it earlier, like you found that turmeric is probably along the lines of reishi in the sense of a, a turnoff, uh, like yeah. adaptogens to some people. And it's different. You know, it's so interesting, like the language studies that we've done and how we talk about our products, because yes, turmeric is an extremely like trending ingredient and, you know, people like it, but the actual word turmeric turns out is still scary. Like turmeric was one of Whole Foods top 10 trends for the year. And like they had signs by our turmeric bags and Whole Foods in the Midwest and that's great, but at the end of the day, people are still a little wary of it. So the new bags now say it's the same formula, but it's golden chai with lemon, just to be a little more, ooh, that sounds like inviting and tasty. That's what they call it here. They call it like a the golden hour latte. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, part of me as like a consumer, I was like, oh, I just want to be real. And not that that's not real, it's the same thing, but just kind of like straightforward and this is what it is and letting them know but it's really interesting 
so there was a time not too long ago where I was getting like a deck a week about someone who's starting into the adaptogen market. Oh yeah. And I'm looking at this and I didn't get it. Like, what is this thing and why does it matter? And so I just start doing all this research. And basically what I found out was at the end of the day, there's like the emerging marijuana, weed, CBD business. Mm -hmm. And for the people who find it taboo, they love the adaptogen market because it means they're not taboo, mm -hmm. but it's the same benefit. And so the adaptogen market is following the growth of the CBD market. Interesting. Okay, cool. I get it. But does it flare out? I think so. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Let's pretend it doesn't flare out. And you're from the future, which you are at the moment. And you're rebranding. But you have maca's in this. Mm -hmm. Do you ever think it goes back the other way? Like, do you ever think the light switch goes on and all of a sudden it's like that's the only thing people want? Because you have a lot of money entering the space presently in the adaptogen market. And so the way I look at it is like wherever money flows, education follows. And so this consumer could switch where turmeric is on your bag. And now it's like. It's actually like a benefit. It's a benefit. To have. Yeah. But if I. So then I go, let's go markets. So Irwan, obviously having turmeric, maca, any adaptogen, no Great. problem. People yeah. go, yeah, I want it. Mm -hmm. Chicago, probably not. No. <laughs> hard. But it, this is the hard. It's the hard problem. Yeah. Because it's like, how do you scale knowing you have like. You have ground swells at place mm -hmm. or in place, but also the people making the decisions at Whole Foods are probably in Chicago. Like if they're not in LA and not getting these decks, they don't see it coming. Right. Unless there's consumer research studies, but that's also way behind. And yeah. so it's like this weird, like, this is what I keep saying. Like, I feel like you're from the future because you're seeing it in real time and you're making decisions in, <laughs> in like real time. Yeah. But it's hard. I mean, that's crazy. Like, it's even a trip, like, kind of. Why don't you I do don't two? Know. Can you do two? Can you, like, go? <laughs> is that allowed or no? I mean, I, it's Like, allowed. is that legal? Like, if you said the Whole Foods, hey, Whole Foods, I'm going to go, this product is going to say golden hour. Yeah. And this one in, in the Midwest states, the middle third of the country. I actually and don't know. Because, I mean, probably. Because I, uh, it would have to be coded. It would be complicated with, with the SKU? distributors. Because, like, for example, like. Would it be a different SKU? Um, would yeah, they it would notice? have to be a different Would they skewing. notice? I mean, no. I mean, we're just, That's like, thing. we just did a switch with. I think you do an A-B like, test on, on the, like, velocities. of it. I just find it fascinating. And we actually love doing even, so a big thing for us with retail, one of the learning lessons I took away was having a really good merch team. So the people on the ground that are taking pictures on the shelves. Yeah. So we, we can even see now, like, what stores still have, like, the cluster bucks that say buckwheat granola clusters which would be the bags that say turmeric lemon okay. versus which stores now have the golden chai with lemon. So maybe we've done some scrappy A-B testing there before of like, okay, these stores are in granola, these stores are in snacks, which one's better? And of course it's 50-50. You should just but. Instagram at it and A-B <laughs> test it that way. You could like oh, totally yeah. do it by geography and figure this out. And then, yeah, like do a Midwest test versus coast 100%. test and see what resonates. And what that would deduce to me is not how well your product's going to do, but how well the adaptogen market is being funded at present. Because that's really what you're against. That's really what you're scratching the surface on. Right. Which also then means the CBD, you know, marijuana weed market. One thing I had to be kind of come back to on though, and I think it's kind of funny being the type of I don't, there's a lot of different types of founders out there. And I think I'm definitely like the visionary brand builder who had to learn how to like, okay, how do you take this? The magician, the maverick or the muse? Which one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then like, okay, how do we, you know, turn this into like, what's the business that people are buying now to fuel what you see in the future? And like, how do you bring the consumer on that journey? But like one of the things I had to learn right now is what is my goal? My goal is to be America's buckwheat brand and get sprouted buckwheat and our products into every pantry across America. And that affords us the opportunity to take consumers on a journey where we're like, all right, now we're coming out with this single serving that has ashwagandha in it or whatever. But I kind of had to dial back on the adaptogens messaging for now because right now buckwheat is already Right. It's New. good enough. You, okay. And it can only go much. so far into yeah. the future before you reach baby like, steps. Adaptogenic yeah. buckwheat clusters is like mind blowing and exciting for an Erewhon consumer, exciting for me. But it's also a good investor story, right? Because yeah. basically what you say is like, here are the, here are the next five years for the consumer. Mm -hmm. And here's how I, I figured it out. And here's how we're going to attack it. And this yeah. is how we win. I think if that story only gets better, if you can do it 
where you have different products in different geographies. I think yeah, if you can do really, that legally, that's yeah. the win. Like that's how you get your velocities off the charts. And also it like informs, you become then a partner to a Whole Foods or to a Target right. being like, this is where your market's moving and this is the data I have mm -hmm. and this is how I know it's happening. Right. And, and it is exciting dope. to like be in different parts of, I mean, I have such interesting perspectives coming from like growing up my brand and I did grow up in the Midwest mm -hmm. in that environment. And now I'm living in San Diego and I'll go to naturally San Diego events or come up to LA and the whole, I don't know the way people talk about business and trends. It's very different, but yeah, I'm excited to kind of gather, especially now that we're launching into some bigger retailers. Like we've had smaller retailers in LA in the Midwest and Texas, but now we're going big in all three regions. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited. We'll have to, to chat again in six yeah, months because yeah, yeah. we'll yeah. be like, oh my gosh, like snickerdoodles popping off in California, but no one in the Midwest cares about it. Or like, <laughs> we'll see. I would think using that example in the Midwest, snickerdoodle will probably kill. Yeah. So even snickerdoodle is definitely like a very cinnamon forward flavor. There's also maca in that one as well. Yeah. You know, we're still. I see it hidden here yeah. on the back. I'm looking at maca root powder and I'm like, this should be in the forefront. I know. But hey, I'm from the future. I so I get it. I, I get it. I get it. Like so I'm like actually the graphic of designer of this packaging and I still, yeah, you know, you critique away because I'm always like looking at it like, ooh, maybe I change this. But so even on the front of our pack now, we kind of have a stamp, you know, how like lots of products will have like their call out and it's like the crunch of your dreams because we're really emphasizing like we want to be taste forward because it is a little unfamiliar. Like, mm -hmm. don't worry, it tastes good. But I could see maybe, you know, like another brand. I don't know if you follow Doe from LA, D-E-U-X, all no. their- D-E-U-X, no. They're crushing it, um, mostly D2C, but they're going into like Erewhon Whole Foods, all that. What do they um, do? Enhanced cookie dough, AKA adaptogenic cookie dough, okay. which there's a lot of, <laughs> believe it or not, a lot sure. of adaptogenic cookie doughs out there, but they just have really hit it with the messaging. And they like always have like- such a niche, niche, niche market. Maybe I know. not, maybe not. I'm really know. curious to see how, cause they're an LA brand, and they're like getting into SoCal retailers, yeah. but how that works. It doesn't. I bet I'm the Midwest way. person coming this way, like you. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's harder at the time when you're building it at the start. So we're from and you're the talking future, about, yeah. yeah, you're in the future and you're talking <laughs> about all this in the Midwest and people are like, dude, what? Do you have pressure to put other products, like to, to get out other products? Do you get that question a lot from like investors? Are they like, what else are you working on? Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's interesting because we are the first buckwheat brand. And I think, you know, in some ways I was so brand forward and building a brand before building a business. And in some ways, you know, we had to do the catching up on the business and be like, okay, like we found some that turns and, you know, get to the million in revenue and beyond. Yeah. But at the same time, I need to protect this. Like I want to build the platform where we're the one building the future uses of buckwheat. There's a lot that you know, I have in my mind. There's deriv other derivatives? Yeah. Like what? Well, just other kind of use cases, I guess, like putting it into a more like single serve snacking form. and Like the seasoning? Oh yeah, even like our, we love using our D to C to kind of test what's really resonating with people. So we even did the everything buck seasoning. So kind of our take on like a crunchy Trader Joe's everything, everything seasoning yeah. and doing something savory, but yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff we can do. I think the the focus for this year, for sure, like we're about to be launching in massive retailers and being successful somewhere. Like Kroger is the number one retailer by volume in the country. HEB is number three. And we have opportunities with both of them. So the North Star is high turns with the cluster bucks there. That unlocks more opportunities. That unlocks, you know, being able to go back to them and be like, oh, we were so successful with our cluster bucks. Now we have your trust. So let's launch like our new innovation straight into Whole Foods or whatever, rather than having to like do what I've did the past four years, which was like prove its worth and find the right fit and like get someone to give us a chance. You're already so, there. Yeah. Where are you at from a funding perspective now? We have raised, the so last year we raised, I actually did a Republic campaign. What does that mean? Um, it's a crowdfunding okay. campaign, okay. kind of like we. Is that a website? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like a WeFunder? Yeah, like a WeFunder, okay. um, but it's just a different platform. So equity. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, equity crowdfunding. Yeah. It was on a safe note. So we raised 155K there. And then through that, because crowdfunding, you can like legally 
advertise like, hey, we're raising money. And actually one of our lead investors from that discovered us through the Republic campaign and we ended up closing an additional 600K there. We're actually raising a little bit more for these massive retail launches and then using that to kind of hit three to $4 million run rate and then. Everybody says to make it in CPG, you have to raise 20 to $25 million. That's a lot of money. Do, do you think that's right? Um, It's something I've been told by multiple CPG founders, some who are in it, some who mm-hmm. have made it. I mean, you definitely hear of that. I'm just cautious, especially as a solo female founder. It's a lot harder to raise. And every time you raise, you're probably just inevitably giving up a little more equity than, you know, if your founding team looks a little different. So a big thing for me is just making sure we have like a really solid margins. Let's get like our goal is to try to get profitable and then use growth capital to just expand on what we've done. Is the idea for that 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 these potential investors are going to look past you and just see the numbers and then you'll have much more of a standing yeah, point? I yeah. think. Yeah. And I even it's really interesting with the experience of raising. I talk to a lot of awesome founders who were dudes in Chicago who were helping me a lot. And I was like, they were showing me their decks. And I was like, oh, make my decks look just like theirs. And they're like, oh yeah, you could go for it. Raise 500K, no problem. You got like a really cool idea. No one else is doing it. And it just doesn't work the same. (laughs) So I think, A, I would talk to more female founders and what their path to that was. And I think at the end of the day, like you can't argue with numbers. Because ultimately people are going to trust me less because of like being a woman, which is annoying. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. I mean, like not everyone. Okay. You find the right people. Yeah. And I think I'd rather work with investors. But, you, but that... you definitely feel that you're saying. Oh, yeah. A lot more than. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've been told I need like an adult in the room. <laughs> we, we just talked to Beckon and they were in the process of raising money. And she was actually given the advice that she needs to bring on a male co-founder oh yeah if, if she wants to be like taken seriously Someone while that looks like Nick. <laughs> genuinely like my fiance and i've talked about like he's like should i just sit in on the meeting or our sales team are guys and i'm like can i put your faces on our deck because it it helps they're like really i'm you like block that out though right 100 percent. i mean at this point now it's just like it it's really part of the game yeah like it did upset me and like i think it ate away at me in the first year of raising it really like broke me down because I just didn't realize how, you know, for the first time you experience like your whatever discrimination you have, you're like, damn, I didn't realize it was like that. Or like maybe I was immune to it. Cause I always thought like, yeah, I know like there's things with men and women, but I'm like busting those myths, but then it happens to me still. But now, yeah, like you kind of build thicker skin around it and then you just, you know, this is how it is and you're here to elevate your woman owned business, which in turn, like the next generation of women trying to build their businesses or whatever they're building are going to have more respect. So we, we had a Modamily, Yvonne. Yep. So this guy named Yvonne is basically solving for the long tail of dating. And so the whole concept is you want to have a kid, but you're single and you're 35 and I want to have a kid and in the app, we have mm-hmm. multi, we have like the same political views and we want to raise our kids in similar ways, but we just want to co-parent. Mm-hmm. So he, he started this company that basically match makes this concept. And he takes care of the legal and so there's like, this is where we're going to live, this is how we're going to raise the kid. And so it's all sorted. And so he gets told a lot to have a female co-founder. Yeah. All the time. Oh, like 100%. all the time. That totally makes by sense, men. yeah. And so like he was telling me we play tennis wow. and I was like, that is such a fascinating story, right? That yeah. he is talking to mostly men <laughs> and they're like, you need and they're like, the you need a female right. co-founder. Wow, isn't that a little? It's a little mind blowing, right? Funny. Yeah, it's, it's just like, yeah. And I'm like, what script. are they? What's the fuck? Like, what are you picking? You can't pick and choose. Yeah. What are you talking about? And it's kind of like, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to control. And even as a woman, I have to check myself. And even when I was in a like more standard workplace, like, was I respecting someone's ideas more just because of like a deep rooted like cultural thing where like I think the guy has the better ideas or is like a better leader. I don't know. It's really, you know, you kind of have to not let it slow me down. Like everyone has their battles. Just remember Yvonne's story. Remember remember there are men out there. (laughs) Not many. He's the only one I've ever heard from. I'll have to talk to him. We could, uh, all the girls can give him some advice. (laughs) Yeah, sure. He needs a female co-founder. I mean, you know, been there. I mean, if I were to do it again, honestly, I'd probably 
try to have a co-founder. Really? Yeah. Just to divide some of the work or? Yeah. Okay. And I think I just, have, it's become quite clear. Does your fiance really want to be a part of it? Does he? Oh, kind of, right? I mean, like it seems really to make sense. And he's operationally minded. Sometimes I'm like, man, can you just come do this? But yeah. Good he's milk. also on a, Good milk, yeah. a run yeah. with a tech company, so. Good and, milk, who and, makes uh, the almond milk in this. Uh, we invested in, in Brooke, and oh, so yeah. her husband awesome. became the CEO. Yeah. Oh, wow. Dennis. Yeah, see, honestly, I could see that happening. He was in the film industry and left that, and then... Because uh, like he, I think his role on film sets was an assistant director, which is basically you're running the set. Right. And so it made sense for him to, to run operations for that company then. Yeah. And running like something like that, a startup, like it is all so much learning. So it's more just like, what are your natural? Like, Do what you're good at. And I'm naturally like a brand builder, innovation, vision, blah, blah, blah. But had to kind of learn the back end of like, how can we like model this out, like to have a mitigate risk and stress on our forecasting and like fundraising strategy, getting stuff A to B. When I launched Lil Bucks, again, small little farmer's market, whatever, but I launched, of course, I was like, we need to have the most perfect website because I was a designer. So way overvalued how beautiful my website needed to be. And I'm like, cool, announced it on Instagram. We launched, great, got like 50 orders, exciting. And then I was like, I have to ship them. And I was like, literally had not thought through that at all. Like, this is just how hilarious and I'm very like impulsive and let's do it and did not think about, you know, the follow through operational side. So I was like digging through my apartments, like recycling, like getting boxes, had to go install a printer. That's a real skill, like learning how to, my first company, I had to like, I never had gone to a USPS in my life. And oh yeah. And now here then you I became was best like, friends with them. How do I do this? What? Like, where do I sign? Oh, What's yeah. the right envelope for me? Nobody knows how to ship, Nobody. but then you have a business. And they and get mad like at you. Expert. They're like, you don't know. They get mad. They're all mm -hmm. very like, you know, a little aggressive. At least yeah. this was in Boston. And so they're even like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, super yeah. salty with you. That's just their default. But then once you figure it out, they're like, oh, come here. Come oh yeah. They you. like would, I'd always like, you're not late. ready. Diego, like, come here. I'm like, the yes. post office closed at 6 PM and I'd rock up at 602 with like a packed car of boxes and my little wagon and they'd have the door open for me. Like, it's you. That's yeah. when you know you need to quit your job, by the way. That's usually one of the big signs. Is when you're they know you're you going, you're going to USPS oh, entirely, two, like three of those a day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or it's like, yeah, that's when you know. Yeah. When, when there's a wagon with you, it's time to probably. My first thought was. Yeah, the was wagon was like, we need to get a 3PL. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say like USPS or UPS, uh, they get mad at you for not knowing what to do. I, in my mind, that's an opportunity for them to like have like how-to videos on their website. Like get, get people to that stage They're where. Not that sophisticated. No. No, but, yeah, nobody knows. It's also you're a small business owner. It's complicated. <laughs> like, it's a lot yeah. more complicated than people think. Yeah. Do you have any tips when you're fundraising? Like things that you, is it like a mental state of mind you put yourself in? Because like I, I think about it like this, like for when I invested in, let's say, Paul, mm -hmm. really for me it was straightforward is do I like the product? Do I think it's the best shit or like close, like same thing with Brooke. Do I think this product is unbelievable? Right. Yes, cool. Do the velocities agree with me? Yeah. Especially for you, like you're in CPG. So same thing, right? Same right. metric. And I look at the deck and I'm like, it looks correct. And then it's like, do I just believe this, this founder is crazy enough, dumb enough, smart enough, whatever enough yeah. to run through a wall to figure it out. Right. And if the answer to that is yes, that's, that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. But I think for like a, like a VC, the velocities are really, I mean, that's really it. I don't. Oh yeah. Right. And I think. You built them. Yeah. So. <laughs> you can't really argue with them too. Like it's really exciting. Knock on wood to have this opportunity with bigger retailers because we feel very confident that we figured out strong velocities, even without our two new SKUs that are a lot more, I think, approachable flavor wise. And so even like conservative forecasting at a lower point velocity than what we're used to seeing, it still looks very good. So we're excited about that. But yeah, I would say with fundraising, I think A, try to do it as fast as you can. Hard. Because, yeah, yeah, it's time consuming, but you create a lot of urgency around it, whatever that is, I think can help. Even, I think, investors kind of feel like, oh, am I going to miss out on this deal? Everyone's looking for deals. And then at the same time, I spent a lot of time talking to the wrong people. What, what does that mean? Just people that weren't. Like, if they're not serious, you just entertain it. You keep entertaining it. I mean, there's one thing to say for networking, but I'd be talking to, like, venture funds that 
in the Midwest that were not investing in the type of product I was creating. So I would spend all these times, and especially it was pre-COVID, driving all over the place for these meetings. And of course, they're like, this is cool. Like, I'll take a meeting with this girl. But not focusing on the people that are really excited, you know, look at who else they're investing in and what type of founders they invest in. Because I spent a lot of time talking to people that were a little more like, this idea is really, especially in the Midwest, like, you're too much in the future and not a good way. Like, it scared them. And then yeah, on top yeah. of that, like, what types of founders are they investing in? And now looking back, I'm like, they were not investing in people like me. Yeah. So I spent a ton. And that's good to network and, like, learn and get good feedback. It's always good to, like, kind of take in more info. But, like, I would be more targeted on how I'm spending my time. Because otherwise, if you talk to every single person ever, it's very time consuming. That's the one thing I've learned in fundraising where I know immediately if there's friction mm -hmm. and I'm out. Like, I'm like, this isn't for you. Yeah. And I can tell by the question you ask. I can tell by there's a whole host of things that, right. that basically give me a signal like it's too much for, or it doesn't, it's not right. And I just leave. I'm like, sorry, this isn't for you. That's good, honestly. Respect the time. Respect there the time. Sometimes, you have to. Like, like if someone's down. judging your five year right. projection, see ya. Yeah. So great to meet you, Bob, Dick, and <laughs> yeah. Harry. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. And I think now I'd be more confident to be like, let's just be real. You know, let's just talk about why you're not going to. And like, oh, we agreed. To, like, I've talked to someone who's oh, like, go that far, right? I don't get, you know, I just don't believe in hero ingredient businesses. And I'm like, cool. See well, ya. we just don't believe in the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, like Quaker Oats. Ever heard of them? I think your story is <laughs> from the future. I really do. I think you're from the future. I think you are I feel like an alien. touching a market. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's your story. Like the yeah. way, if I were to invest or not invest, but, or even like pitch your company, mm -hmm. I look at you like, you are touching the adaptogen market in a place that's it's safe and in a place that it's becoming safe. Right. And you're just going to destroy that trend. And then once it switches, once the market, which we all know it will, yeah. you're there. I'm already, yeah. You won. Been here the whole time. You've been here you the whole time. The well, even that's like, the we story. just talked and to so a to me, certain... it's like, put your money in now before this light goes yeah. off and the valuation triples. Yeah. Do it now. That's, that's how I look at your story because I know the trends. I think also too, it is a lot about the story and That's I used everything. to not have kind of the story from like what the, the investors want to hear. What is that story? And it was more just like, here's my idea and here's what we're doing. And like, we're going to grow a good business, but it's like, there needs to be kind of a better angle than like everyone saying that. But like, I think you're right. Yeah. That's your story. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be like, I found this buckwheat. Doesn't matter where underserved, unbelievable supply is huge. Mm hmm. We decided to mix it in a way that gives you uh, an ability to enjoy a snack. We're hitting the adaptogenic market now. And like, these are our velocities. And, and, in, and in five years time, and the switches, right? The switches in the Midwest, we're all, we've been here the whole time. Yeah. Same product, same SKUs, same everything. I think that's it. I mean, we're already Sign starting here. to see it. Like, <laughs> Write your check. Buckwheat is growing like, I think it's supposed to be 1.1 billion market in the next five years for buckwheat as a food and the snack segments driving the most growth. Does Russia, Ukraine make this harder? Um, it's putting pressure Price. on like, similarly with grains, it's putting pressure on different sources, mostly yeah. in North America now, particularly for buckwheat. But fortunately we contracted with our regenerative yeah. farmer, which we were doing just because of the mission and like, what I wanted to do just sustainability wise, but also we're like, okay, good. Glad we got that. <laughs> so that one farm, can they sustain like this kind of growth? Like going from, like you said, 181 stores to 600, like they can, they can For handle sure. that. Okay. Yeah. We have probably, I would say at least three more years of just being able to source from them, depending on yields and all that. But even last year was our first harvest with them. And there was actually a massive drought in Minnesota and we were still got a pretty good yield out of that. So we're going to do double this year. We still have other sources in case we need to supplement. Or like, for example, the heart, the processing took a really long time with the regenerative buckwheat. So we had to wait to launch with it. We used other buckwheat in the meantime. The world might even help you. I mean, ultimately, if the government wants to reduce it, the dependence, they'll just get subsidies in yeah. place for these farmers. And then you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be the you'll next crop. And then we'll be way. there. We'll be yeah. like, we've been here the whole time. You've been here the whole doing time. Doing buckwheat. But right. yeah, we just had a future. meeting with a pretty big account where they're like we're finally like i've been trying to hit them up i even talked to them like two years ago and i've been doing this the whole time and all of a sudden they they come be asking me for a meeting they're like we're seeing tons of buckwheat searches so we need to talk to you i'm like 
Well, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. I'm here. <laughs> We're ready. So have you seen other competitors sprout up in that in that time frame then? So I'm actually really excited. I mean, I've obviously been on the Buckwheat Pulse for a few years now, so I'm very close to it. I can sniff out any Buckwheat products launching. One, there's actually someone coming out with the Buckwheat Milk in a few months. There's a milk for everything. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, at least from a kind of co-branding perspective and elevating the awareness of Buckwheat, that's great. Another one, it's a different type of Buckwheat. It's called Himalayan Tartary Buckwheat. And there's this company, they sell like Himalayan tartary buckwheat flour, but they just raised 4 million. And so I'm like, great, pave the way. It's a different type of buckwheat. Is that but a even just free like, flour then? Yeah. Okay. And it's extremely nutrient dense, like our buckwheat, but there's different antioxidants in it. So it's a little different, but like, all right, heavily funded buckwheat company. Welcome to the club. Like elevate the education. And then I've been talking with a few other bigger brands that I won't, you know, release their new products coming up, but they're using buckwheat in some formulations Mm -hmm. and they had to like present to their board, like why now is the time to finally use buckwheat? Cause some of those boards were hesitant to use it because consumers were confused, but they're finally at a point where they feel comfortable with the consumer understanding and they're taking the leap to have buckwheat in like their cookies or crackers. So it's still in a different format as us, which is good for us, but it's elevating buckwheat, which makes me happy. (laughs) I love it. Anything else we should know? Well, you can find us in Bristol Farms and Ralph's coming up in a couple months. Whole Foods Irwan. Yeah, Whole Foods Irwan, the good stuff. But yeah, look out on... Love Lil Bucks, because as we were discussing, the Lil Bucks handle is taken by a dancer rapper. <laughs> also Who's named Lil in Bucks. jail. Who's in jail. So Shout out to Lil Bucks, by the, the way. Yeah. You come out. Have a <laughs> we'll have some Lil Bucks waiting for you. Collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Wait He'll be minute. like, what? Why is there my name at every store in America now? <laughs> <laughs> Why do so many people love Lil Bucks? Yeah. You know, we're just doing the good work. <laughs> he'll, he'll Google himself and, and find you guys. He'll be like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you so much. That was our conversation with Emily from Lil Bucks. And since you're still with us, you might want to consider subscribing. And if you've already done that, you might want to consider leaving us a review. We are found at Startup Storefront on every social media platform, with the exception of Twitter where we can be found at STS Podcast LA. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capolini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is by Double Touch. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.